Go. All right, so welcome back to The Young Idealist and my series on classical German philosophy, German idealism, German romanticism, uh, the Jewish thinkers and thought, as well as German modern philosophy. And today I have a very special guest with me. Um, and I have been getting to know his work over the last week. I have Dr. Zachary J. Breiterman, um, who's a professor and works in the field of modern Judaism. His research and teaching explores the shifting aesthetic canons as they shape Jewish thought and culture from the 17th century until the present. Research and um, Dr. Breiterman's research and teaching interests touch upon the impact of the Enlightenment, modernity, modernism, and postmodernism upon Jewish ideas about God, ritual, text interpretation, community, life with special emphasis on Jewish philosophy, theoretical, theoretical eth eth aesthetics, um, and Jewish philosophy. So, Dr. Breiterman, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and today, you <laughs> yes, today we're going to be talking about um, the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber. Um, maybe we can start off with who is Buber and, and maybe why Buber? So we'll start off with who Buber was. Uh, Buber was was really one of the great public intellectuals of uh, the of the Germanophone world at, at, at the Fond de Siecle, the, at the turn of, of, of the last century, from the 19th century uh, to the 20th century. He he thought he wrote uh, from, oh, as early as 1900 until his death in uh, 1965. Um, he was born in uh, Vienna, uh, spent 10 years, a uh, uh, product of a broken home, uh, uh, spent 10 years uh, out on the out in the country uh, with his grandfather, the great Mid Midrash scholar Solomon Buber. Uh, in in what was then Lemberg in the Austro-Hungarian Empire and now Lvov in in modern day uh, Ukraine. Um, he went to study philosophy and art history at the University of uh, Vienna, an avid the theater goer. He's referred to in Jewish philosophy as the philosopher, but if anything, he was everything the aesthete. Uh, he really was one of the great German literaten at the time. Uh, he was corresponding with everybody, with Georg Simmel, with the poets Rilke, the 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 dramatist uh, Hugo von Hofmannsthal, uh, Stefan Zweig, Arnold Zweig, Hermann Hesse, uh, Werner Sombart. He he wrote to everybody, and everybody uh, knew him. Uh, he became famous for writing about religion. Uh, he had a volume called Ecstatic Confessions. He wrote about Hasidism and translated Hasidic tales into a German neo-romantic Jugendstil frame. Um, and he is very, very, very much of that world um, as, it, as it turned at the turn of the century and then as it broke and reconfigured uh, in, in, in after World War I. Fantastic. Um, that sounds like um, such a complex life. A lot of these thinkers live either really, really tragic lives or their, or their um, you know, their lives completely always centered around intellectual figures or they're, you know, trying to figure out who they are. And um, who would you say are Buber's main uh, philosophical and, and even um, theological influences on his thought? Well, he'll start off with Kant and Nietzsche. I think it was primarily Nietzsche. Um, I think the I think Buber, uh, from the beginning to the end, should be understood within the tradition of German uh, Lebensphilosophy. Uh, he was quite close to Georg Simmel, uh, and and uh, and to Wilhelm Diltai. Del uh, so he's very much in in in, in traveling in, in those particular circles. 
Uh, I think the fundamental point about Georg Simmel in particular is a critique of a substantivist notions of, of, of self and community and identity. So this is at the beginning of modern physics, and we begin to see that the idea of concrete substance doesn't really work, that the, the objectivity or the gegenstandlichkeit of, of objects and things and persons uh, are, 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 are really pulled into uh, relations, um, relations and, and, and those kinds of determinations. And you begin to loosen up a sense of reality and, and, and the real at this particular moment in, in the German modernist tradition and, 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 and late, you know, late 19th century, early 20th century culture. Excellent. That's what a great answer. Um, every time I, I read up on him, it says that he's an existentialist and I wasn't sure. Um, is he a part of this tradition or would you, you you've already said he's he's very close to the uh, a form of humanism before we hit record. Maybe we can talk about um, his his thought in in um, along with humanism and and how it maybe relates to Kant, because I think you were originally going to talk about Kant and Nietzsche sure. as well, too. So he's, 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 he's an existentialist, if we think about that in the broadest sense of the term, uh, if we want to trace it back to Nietzsche, if we want to trace it back to Kierkegaard, he's an existentialist in that way. He's he's not an existentialist in in let's say Sartre was a was was an existentialist, but he's concerned very much with the um, the experience of the of of concrete human existence, right? Um, he's not interested in essences and essential structures. He's interested in the concrete life of the human person in relation to the world and to beings in the world. Uh, he starts off in his in an autobiographical fragment. He 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 talks about as a as a young boy he's reading Kant. I, I think this is kind of unbelievable, but this is the story he tells. And and what he learns from Kant is is this this the, the horror that time and space aren't real. Uh, that they're simply constructs of the mind, and 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 they don't really uh, cohere to anything out there in the world, and and his response to this sort of Kantian, this Kantian sort of catastrophe to thought is is the chain. It's this Promethean uh, projection of of oneself. Uh, out into the world over the abyss, like Zarathustra's tightrope walker, and 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 that's the beginning of his philosophical thinking, what we would call his philosophical thinking, uh, which is in a non-realist mode, um, and it's it, it 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 it's it's based on the formation of this this kind of perfected this perfected human shape. Um, and the perfection of a human shape and its movement in the world in a, as a kind of unified figure. If, if you think about Art Nouveau uh, 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 painting, you can still painting, right? It's this, it's this sort of sensual figure caught in a kind of void in a sort of a, 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 a sort of sort of an empty space, right, of the picture frame. And I think that's how 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 Buber thought about 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 things. Um, uh, he wrote about Nijinsky. He wrote about the Isenheim altar. He's he's really really interested in the the Gestalt form uh, and as 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 unified and beautiful and holistic and. Uh, and and that whole picture world gets broken at World War One, right? Um, his 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 good friend, his dear friend, uh, uh, the anarchist, uh, political philosopher and activist uh, Gustav Landauer rebuked him quite sharply and said that you you can't aestheticize um, the human structure or the human being in 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 this world of 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 violence and. And mayhem, and and Buber was really responsive to that, and it's it's that crisis, it's that kind of an aesthetic crisis, a moral crisis, 
uh, a philosophical crisis that's that's uh, basic to what um, Paul Mendes Flores referred to as the dialogical turn uh, in Buber, which all of a sudden um, is is no longer predicated on a sense of wholeness, but is is based on uh, an essential kind of twofoldness. Um, the twofoldness of human being, the twofoldness of human identity, uh, defined not in terms of substance, but in terms of relations. So there's no such thing as an I, but there's only the I in relation to an it. There's no such thing as an I, except the I in relation to a you or a thou. Uh, Germans, uh, Buber's German was a do, right? So a very informal. And 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 that becomes that comes becomes the basis of 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 what Buber understood by dialogue and encounter uh, between between persons and everything, right? Between between a person and a tree, uh, or or a kind of a, a mica a, a, a fragment of you know stone or or animals or other human beings or works of art or or ultimately with 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 the divine and with God, this becomes basic to um, to his structure of thinking. Concrete sensual uh and in that way i think um existentialist uh but not in that kind of psychotic vein that you might uh identify with sartre right where the relationship between the i and the you is completely uh at odds and in, in conflict well that's that was a fantastic answer and you brought up the whole idea of the moral and of god and I guess my next question to you is, what was Buber's relation to um, his Jewishness and, and to Judaism? Um, mm -hmm. If we can go there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, so uh, Buber, Buber grew up in a very sort of secular assimilated uh, Austrian, uh, Austrian Germanophone uh, uh, milieu, uh, upper class, uh, a bit spoiled, a bit of a dandy. Um, his mother, I think, leaves the father and then he goes off to live uh, in, I don't know if it was the country, if he was living in the town of, of, of Lvov or whether he was out. In the, he, he writes a lot about being out in the country. And, and, and his grandfather, Solomon Buber, was one of the great um, was one of the one of the great sort of modern scholars of Midrash. And it's under his influence that we see the young Buber. Buber's not growing up in right in a religious home in an observant home so he comes to this um uh, mediated through relations the mediation of the relationship with the grandfather um it's never quite clear why or how or when he took the deep dive uh, into um Hasidism. i think some of this has to do with um what was then called a uh, folk psychology uh a sort of folkish psychology he's becomes interested in um the 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 sort of it's it's kind of draws from herder i think you know goes goes back to that 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 peoples have this sort of spirits and uh and uh and 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 he gauges in to judaism it's sort of kind of like race thinking um uh, uh that there is this um uh, there is this sort of there's this essence in the Jewish psyche or soul that uh, that he finds very, very powerful. It later gets tied up with his. So he looks at, let's say, Hasidic traditions, Eastern European Hasidic traditions, and he sees there he sees a kind of authentic form of a, of, of a depth spirituality of something that's 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 deep and then transcends time and space we get back to time and space i think it's super important right so the hasidic master transcends time and space and he tries to convey buber tries to convey that transcending of time and space that he imagines he's seeing in the hasidic tradition in masters like the baal shem tov and 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 uh uh, Rabbi Nachman of Ratzlaff, right? So he he's he's he. There's like there's like you know the feminist um, theorist Betty Friedan talked about the the feminine mystique. So 
a lot of thinkers at this time at the at the fond de siècle. Um, part of the crisis of modernity is this this attraction to, in this particular case, uh, the Jewish mystique. Um, it's kind of primitivism, if you were to think about that in art. Um, but he's he's drawn to these this sort of this 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 kind of a depth holism um that he thinks um modern life with all of its alienations is 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 unable to sustain and 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 this is where he wants to situate himself uh he situates himself there spiritually in the broadest sense of the word not necessarily religiously certainly not in terms of traditional observance uh and also politically uh, in terms of his work uh, with Herzl and in the Zionist movement, uh, uh, trying to think through what is the future of of this people at this particular uh, time in, in in the early 1900s, um, the Zionism becomes a certain becomes its own thing. Uh, we were supported a, a binational state in Palestine um, later in life and became very famous for um, a, approaching the whole Arab uh, Jewish conflict in Palestine around the position of of of, of dialogue and mutuality. Uh, but if we were to think about this original turn, right, it's so much about the turn to a people and the turn to a certain kind of I think psyche or consciousness or awareness of a, a, a way of being in the world um, that that was so important for Buber's Judaism. It drew him to then perfected figure, whether it was the Hasidic figure or whether it was the prophet, right? Um, as a kind of open open form of of spiritual being in the world that that again transcending these time and space categories, which had been thrown into such confusion, uh, not just by uh, Kant, but in the entire modern world and the entire modern experience. Well, see, these, these are what, this is, these conversations are why I always have these, I love these discussions. I, I loved how you kind of traced it back to time and space again and, and then kind of, it was nice to get a little bit of his life as well as he's going through these moments. Um, we had discussed a little bit of the I and thou or the I and you. Yeah. Um, and my my introduction to Buber was through um, a, a graduate course um, looking at um, the text I and thou or I and you. And I was wondering maybe if you could kind of hash out maybe the kind of the kind of main themes of I and you? What are the, the main concepts? What, what is Buber trying to do in this text? Well, it's 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 a I guess it starts as a theory of subjectivity, but it's a non-subject of it's a non-subjective theory of subjectivity. It's 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 non-substantialist. There's the he starts with the notion of the self. Um, and he starts very early, the opening passages of the text in part one, it's a three-part thing. Um, part one, he just introduces our basic categories of, 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 of human subjectivity, that human subjectivity or the subjectivity of beings are, are dependent not, uh, are dependent in, in terms of relation. So... Uh, I don't simply exist um, in my own right as an individual. I only exist in relation to things and to it, to what he calls the it world. Um, and then there is another mode of being, which is my relation to the you, whoever the you might be. Uh, it could be a cat. It could be a tree. It could be God. It could be a work of art, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's, this way that Buber gets at the the essential twofoldness of 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 whether a human being or being, uh, depending on 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 how you want to think this through, um, the it world is just simply uh, the world of calculation of uh, means relations of 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 what is it calls a cause effect um, instrumentality, uh, but it's also a world in which everything is interconnected. This, I think, sometimes gets lost. Buber, 
Buber's concept of the it world is actually quite, quite lovely and quite, quite beautiful. Uh, it's based on interconnection of the tree is interconnected and as an interconnected totality in terms of its own root structure, its branch structure and the way it, it, it branches out into the world. All of this reflects the it structure of, of let's say the tree, right? The tree is, 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 is integrated uh, into the world or into what Buber calls a world order. Uh, no, 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 he calls it the order of the world, right? So the tree is integrated into the order of the world. That's how we experience it in the Kantian sense. That's how we experience it in, in the world as part of that larger nexus. It's also romantic, right? The integrated, the integration of a tree into, with, into that nexus. And the IU is different. The IU is, is maybe more lyrical, uh, the IU is that moment in a relation, let's say, with the tree, where the tree is no longer, where you are no longer simply integrated in a piece or a part of the world, but where you become Welthoft in your own way, where you become an in, where you become an internal world and an exclusive and in a singular world um, in your own right. And that's how I encounter you. Right. So you now fill up the entire picture frame or the entire perceptual frame to to really fill out the world. And then I see the world for you. This is a essential part of, of, of what Buber meant by the IU encounter. Um, he gets made fun of a lot, like like he gets he gets crapped on a lot for being lyrical and mystical and foggy. But I think he's actually quite clear that he's talking about a different kind of subject object relation where um, you just completely you, the you, I'm going to now say you, right? Meaning you in the boober sense, you, you fill up and constitute an entire world um, that is the sole and fixed object of my attention. And it belongs to a moment. And then we come back into the real world um, but the encounter with you isn't in opposition to the world of things and objects, but but rather is the condition for animating that world and and making it more alive and more animate and not frozen, not frozen and cold and set and fixed. So it really becomes the the principle of 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 enlivening things and animating things, um, a little like animism, but I, I don't want to call him an animist. But but it 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 moves towards a a a a, a warm a more warm and more fluid and more flowing notion of the world that frees things up in ways that um, he sees frozen in the modern world. You know, circa nineteen twenty whatever. As you were as you were speaking, um, and, and it's a completely different figure. But I was thinking of Levinas, Levinas's mm -hmm. totality and infinity, where he he's speaking about this kind of Hegelian uh, dialectic of recognition that he calls a violence, because mm -hmm. there is that opposition that you were you were saying in the I, IU. There is no opposition in the sense um, that Levinas is, a, is doesn't want the face of the other to be you know absorbed into the to the other uh, or to, to you um and there's this kind of infinite relationship there and I, I guess a third in a sense is there anything like that going on in boober's i and you is there a kind of i don't want to say a, uh, like an event or god maintaining the the relationship but um is there any kind of event or any kind of ontological structure that's holding on to this connectivity the there's no third party that's grounding the relation right so there's no ground i i, I know like meta you know analytic metaphysics like to talk about grounds right uh the only thing grounding the relation is the relation itself the only thing that grounds the encounter is the encounter itself and the decision and part of it relies on decision the decision to enter into a relation 
Uh, but there's no third thing that that that's that's guaranteeing uh, that's guarantee that's guaranteeing the encounter and and the character of the encounter and and what becomes of the cat uh, becomes of it. Uh, the encounter itself, Buber will famously argue, is without object. Right. Uh, it's not with it. There is no content. There is no content to encounter at, at this level of of Erlebnis, not Erfahrung, but at the level of Erlebnis, there's no there's no content to the encounter except for the actual encounter and touching touching itself. Um, um, that's the only that's 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 all that's at play here. There's there's no it's purely two. It's purely two. And there's a yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. You were about to say something further. It's purely two. Did you want to? No, there's it, it's 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 tied up with a kind of German philosophical eroticism of eros and touch and all of these things. Uh, so it, it it it's it's tied up with that as a as a model of 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 um, of, in, of of what of of uh, encounter in, in the encounter between in, in sort of the encounter in the world of beings with beings and other I don't know I don't know I'm, I'm beginning to lose my thread so let's let me just stop right there no no that's great that's great um, another question and I I really don't want to bring in like Heidegger's structure here but when you were talking about the I it is this a kind of ontic relation as as opposed to an i u would be ontological so there's a different structure when it comes to objects and there are different structures when it comes to like an ontological like a being it's or are ontic. they it's all for boober it's all ontic right so okay. boober boober's not interested in being boober is interested in the being of beings maybe but he's not interested in being so so that's 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 boober's fundamental difference between between himself and 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 Heidegger I don't think Buber ever talks about being um as such but it's always beings um and there's you know being for Heidegger becomes a principle of gathering right becomes the principle around which beings gather or are gathered and sucked in in in, in my not so generous interpretation of heidegger uh sucked into a clearing or into a hold right um you don't you don't you don't have that in 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 Buber because it's 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 that twofoldness the and the beings are in relation to each other they're not they're not they're not absorbed into some kind of foundational ontological center. Um, the center for 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 Buber is the the between, right? The uh, the the in, the insufficient uh, between between beings. And I don't think he's I don't think he ever identified that between space um, with with being. Uh, in, in 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 any deep way. See now, this is fascinating. So now we now we have a kind of uh, organic nexus going on here, and you know, uh, a multiplicity, it's inter interconnectivity. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, brilliant. It's a fourfold without being. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, <laughs> no, that's a great. That's a great example. <laughs> Are there any other works other than I and you that you think um, represent uh, Buber's uh, philosophical oeuvre um, in a sense? So I and thou, you know, sometimes when you're trying to do something new and you're working in a poetic idiom or an aesthetic idiom, you kind of lose, you kind of lose your mind a little bit. And, and, and you, you're looking for, you're looking for a certain kind of poetic kind of gesture to to sort of to, to sort of gather your thoughts and to organize and to articulate your thoughts, um, and I think that happens with Buber and and I and that was really easy to make fun of. I know it was really easy to make fun of, but I think underneath the sort of the lyricism and almost the I think Walter Kaufman referred to it as like it like the hymnology of it all. Uh, there's a really hard philosophical conceptual structure 
that's there at the core. Uh, and it doesn't really change much. But the expression of that philosophical worldview uh, becomes more sober uh, after I and thou. Um, so I would recommend uh, Buber's excellent essays, All in Between Man and Man. The essay, it's a volume entitled Man and Man. The essay dialogue from 1929 is, is just a, a superb redoing and restating of 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 the life of dialogue. Uh, and then the later post-war writings collected in the knowledge of man, uh, which includes a very, very important essay, Distance and Relation. Uh, I also like the essay, Man and His Image Work. Uh, there's a great essay on Kafka too, where he basically says that Kafka was guilty, uh, which which I never really understood before, before reading Buber. Uh, but I think Buber is absolutely right about Kafka, about about J, about K in 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 the trial, right? Um, uh, oh, the S, the the collection of essays between man and man also includes his critique of Kierkegaard, uh, with comments uh, relating to um, to uh, 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 Carl Schmitt. So there's a lot going on in these later writings where they're they may be less famous than i and you uh or i and thou but uh the the the, the conceptual thinking is 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 much more precise and much more um uh, uh recognizable as philosophy uh as to poetics see this this is something i i find interesting and i'm really glad you brought it up um you know because as being a Schillingian myself um when you when you read the middle and late Schelling, he's very poetic, and and often kind of thrown to the side as an obscurist or mm -hmm. a mystic, and and that's not the case. A lot of people miss out on the fact that some philosophers are using you know theosophical ideas and then turning them into concepts or taking a poetic idea, and sometimes it's harder to unpack a poetic idea than it is yeah. say a, a philosophical argument. And so I'm really glad that we're, we're discussing these ideas. So it, it could get out there that, that we should be, we should be returning to Buber. We should be rethinking these ideas and, and going through the text a little more clearer and a little more hermeneutically in a sense. Yeah. What's, what's special about Heidegger is that he's doing the poetic thinking and the philosophical, the late Heidegger, He's doing the poetic thinking and the philosophical thinking simultaneously, uh, which is really quite a trick. Um, in, in Buber's case, I think the poetic thinking is what later generates the philosophical thinking. How did you um, first come into, um, I guess, a, a kind of working relation with Buber? How did you first hear about Buber and 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 when was it that his work grasped, grabbed grabbed a hold of you? Yeah, jeez. Uh, early twenties, I guess I picked it up for the first time. I, I so my philosophical interests started in high school with Spinoza and. Nietzsche and Yiddish literature and translation, particularly Isaac Basheva Singer. I, I was growing up in a kind of Jewish political world, a left wing labor Zionist world. And um, and so it's you know, the Buber was really recognizable to me. Right. Um, uh, um, sort of sort of that kind of a of a political cultural milieu and um and there was just this exposure right exposure to these things why spinoza why nietzsche why why isaac basheva singer is because i was an adolescent boy and you know that stuff appeals to to adolescent boys. Um, but I, I I was really drawn to philosophy. I was really drawn to philosophy first through Spinoza. Um, and then and then I discovered Nietzsche. And that was its own story. And then 
you know, there is this Martin Buber guy that we had bookstores and even Jewish bookstores at the time. And I, I saw the star of redemption and I said, Oh, well, this looks interesting. And I got through about five pages and I didn't understand it. Uh, and I saw Buber's essays on Judaism this from, from his, uh, his speech to the Bar Kokhba Zionist group in Prague, uh, 1910s, 1911s. And, and I thought, my God, this is a, this is a world. It's a, it's a it's it's a it's a thought world it's a it's a romantic world um it's it's a critical world um and it's 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 situated in and saturated by by community and communal form and belonging together and uh i was just lucky you know i was just really lucky um that you know, I grew up in the kind of home that I grew up in. Um, was involved in Zionist circles, very close to the kibbutz ideal, to the kibbutz idea and the kibbutz sort of practice way of life, sort of this socialism. Um, and then there's Buber who is trying to convey the the spirit of all of that, and that stuff just uh, appealed to me. Yeah, I think the I think how you how you explained it kind of resonates with me as well that that um buber has this kind of romantic image in a sense in opposition to the kind of mechanical mm -hmm. uh, emergence of the mm -hmm. modern world at that yeah. time um uh, and so it it's it, it very nice it, the way that you described it um it was in what the about... 70s. this was also in the 70s right late <laughs> 70s and uh and and you know my 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 world at the time was saturated the, the my cultural world was saturated in sort of sort of a psychedelic uh psych old psychedelic uh grateful dead uh um uh, just sort of lsd alternative ways of thinking about things and reality and there's that was that was that was part of it too and and that's reflected if you, if there's there's a lot of that going on in the 1900s as well that's great that's great what are you working on right now I, i've noticed i mean you've put out some wonderful texts wonderful wonderful texts um is there any do you have a new project that you're currently working on or you have a paper you're working on or or a book that you'd like to maybe talk about for a second yeah no i've been it's 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 taken me over 10 years um when i was when i was when i finished with buber and modernism i was really interested in postmodernism but i couldn't find any postmodern thinkers who were at the same level as Buber and Rosenzweig, because there are no great postmodern sort of Jewish thinkers or Jewish texts. So I decided I wanted to really look into French theory, uh, French French post-structuralism, French theory. I I, I got tr attracted to Deleuze. Uh, and there's a Deleuze-Buber relation, I think, somewhere in there that needs to be written in terms of a paper. Uh, but then also Talmud. I was looking for Talmud. I was looking at Talmud and I wanted to to do a sort of what would happen if we were to think through philosophical concepts through the lens of a of let's call it a philosophical Talmud based on the idea of virtual and virtual worlds and virtual reality. And it turned a massive, massive project that turned into two books, and I'm completing the first book now. Um so it, it, but it's it's taken it's taken forever. I just started reading Talmud. It was this sort of entry into this imaginal sort of counter reality. That okay, that sounds fascinating. So I can't wait till that's published. Um, and when it is published, you should come back here and we should talk about the book because that would be oh great. God, oh my god, I will. Um, Absolutely. You brought up something and um we're almost at the the hour mark that I want to I don't want to make it too long. Sure. But you brought up Rosenzweig and Buber and I know that there is a because before I hit record you had brought up a kind of relationship or a mm -hmm. tension between sure. Rosenzweig and Buber. Do you think maybe the la our last question we can talk about maybe their relationship if that's possible? Well they were they were really close to each other. Um they worked together, they uh collaborated uh they collaborated on this this very strange experimental uh translation of the bible uh, was meant to carry and convey the sense of the sound of revelation 
that the Bible was written in a certain style and a certain Hebrew that was meant to stimulate the revelation itself and the experience of revelation, not just in this part and that part, but in the entire structure of the of the biblical expression is is the is is a is a is a tangible sound of revelation. Uh, they were kind of kooky that way, right? Um, the thing with the thing in modern in contemporary Jewish philosophy and the study of modern Jewish philosophy is at a certain point, uh, Rosenzweig stood out as more authentically Jewish uh, because he was more interested in, I don't know, Jewish law. I think that was part of the that was part of the criteria. And uh, and Buber was considered to be antinomian. Um, and he wasn't antinomian, by the way, he was polynomian, but people miss that. Um, but there was just this thing that people really drew to 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 Rosenzweig and then to Levinas, and it seemed more more serious Jewish, uh, more deeply Jewish. And to to my mind, there's nobody more deeply Jewish than 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 Buber. And 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 among the Jewish philosophers, perhaps no one quite as right philosophically and conceptually um as 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 Buber and and open to open to our world open to a world with 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 uh with with each other with animals with machines uh uh with Jewish sources and Jewish texts there's nobody nobody holds a candle to Buber e to this day nobody holds a candle to this to, to Buber except for maybe Elliot Wolfson well, thank you for that and for uh, and for navigating us through this wonderful uh, discussion about Buber's life, his thought, why we should return to Buber, and you, your passion and your I could tell just by the way that you're speaking about him, you kind of brought him alive in in the the last hour. So I thank you so much for participating in this um, my series, and it was truly an honor to have you here. Thank you so much. Truly an honor to be here. I've I've been an admirer of, of you and and what you're doing uh, for a good many years now, and uh, really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you.